Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for today. We pray, Lord, that you speak to us today, that today we have an insight as to what you want for each and every one of our lives. And Father, I just pray that you speak through me today and that we can all know you that little bit more. In Jesus' name, and the people of God say, Amen. Well, today I'm excited because I want to share a little bit about our vision. Um, you know, we've been uh, seeking God, fasting for 21 days, and, um, and, and during that time, God's been speaking, we do it every year, and God always speaks to us. Like, you know, I was having a chat with Wayne this week, and he's, you know, we were just chatting, and I was excited, you know, I'm mostly always excited. And, uh, and Wayne's like, you know, I don't know why, like, you know, we get excited when God speaks to us. Like, that should be the normal, right? <laughs> we should be worried if he doesn't speak to us. But anyway, we're excited because he's been speaking to us about, you know, what we're going to be doing. And so today I want to talk a little bit about vision. You know, vision is important. Do you know that everything around that we see, that we touch, started with vision? The, like, uh, the chairs that we're sitting on. It started as a vision in someone's mind and they saw it and somehow put it together and created the chair. You know, the clothes we wear came as a vision. Who's excited that someone had a vision for clothes? It was just a dumb thought that came in my mind. But, you know, we're excited, right? We, we wear clothes. You know, it's a vision. You know, maybe the shoes we're wearing or the shirt we're wearing or, or maybe the cool brands that we pay extra money for was a vision in someone's mind. I don't like wearing brands because if they want me to be a billboard for somebody, they better start paying me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't come cheap, you know, so I don't like to wear brands. So. But, you know, the point is that, you know, we, 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 everything started off in a vision in someone's mind. And then they created that vision and, and, and made something happen. And so vision is important. But more so than the vision, I mean, vision's important, but along with the vision, you also need execution. Because you know what? There's a lot of people that got a lot of good ideas and they just stay ideas and they never go anywhere. You know, I come up with a lot of good ideas at church. As soon as I meet with one of the ladies, I'm like, I've got an idea. You see them sort of crouching down and they're oh, no, this means more work. <laughs> but the reality is I probably have about 50,000 ideas for probably every 10 that I implement. You know what I mean? Because sometimes I have too many ideas. But that's Okay. Ten's better than none. And the leaders say, Amen. So, you know, we need to have vision, but we also need to have execution. And in order to execute, and I'm talking about vision, we're not talking about executing people, just in case you're looking at me like, what's his pastor on about, right? So we, we, we're talking about, you know, needing to execute the vision to make it happen. And for that to happen, we need some form of structure or some sort of order or something in order to make the process for that vision to come to pass. In Matthew 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And so this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus is giving a bit of an insight that, like, it requires wisdom. That, you know, uh, we, we need to, first of all, hear the words of him. So we get the vision from Jesus. We hear what it is that he's wanting to speak into our lives. And then we need to put it into practice. We need to execute the vision. Amen? We can't just be hearers and it stops there, through one ear and out the other. Like we need to be people who apply it to our lives. Otherwise, it's kind of like just information. And so, you know, like in this scripture, we, we receive instructions from God. And then we want to put them into practice. The truth is that God, he's blessed Rock Church. We're so blessed, especially those of us that have been here from the beginning. We've seen what God has done in our lives and in the life of this church. And, and, and he's grown the church a lot. And he'll continue to grow the church a lot. But the reality is that in order for us to continue to grow, we need to execute the vision. We need to be able to put things into practice. Amen? We can't just sort of think, oh, yeah, this is good. God spoke to me. We just sort of go at the flow. Do you know what I mean? So why is we need structure? And why is structure important? Well, a couple of quick things. 
First of all, structure enables growth. So if we have a look at the house is built on a foundation, there needs to be some sort of structure. If we don't have a structure, the house isn't going to stand. Amen? So structure brings about growth. But structure also brings, uh, enables us to be mobile. So, you know, it gets you mobile. Like, you know, we all have a skeleton. Some of us look like a skeleton. But we all have a skeleton, and, and our skeleton provides the structure for us to be able to do what we do. If I never had bones in my hands, I wouldn't be so Maltese and talk like I do. I've been asking Simon for months, we need to get a wireless mic. But I think he, he knows if we get one, I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul who motioned with his hands and then preached. I'm just being biblical, that's all. But, you know, we, 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 uh, we need bones. We need some sort of structure to be able to get mobile. And so as a church, it's the same thing. We need some form of structure. Otherwise, we're just going to be like a floppy jalopy like the guy to the right there. Amen? Anyway, what else? Structure also increases our capacity. Because without structure, we can't do I mean, you think we, earlier I showed a picture of a house. If you want to build up in a house and you want to go double story, triple story, or I don't know, I'll talk to Richard later, engineering, whether it's supposed to have a four story house, I don't know. You know but the, the higher you go, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, the probably deeper you need to go or the wider, right? It's an engineering practice. You need to have structure and you need to go deeper in order to go higher. Amen? So here, it increases our capacity. If you have a look at here, this barrel. It's full of water, not wine, in case you're wondering. We're having communion at the end, by the way. But, um, you know, you'll see that, like, the lowest uh, pail size is going to be the maximum capacity that we could reach. Yeah? So uh, our, our, our strongest uh, or our weakest link is going to be our maximum capacity. And so we need to have structure in order to increase capacity. You know... I mentioned earlier, like, we've grown a lot as a church. We've come far from our humble beginnings. If we have a look at um, where we're at today, you'll see, like, we, you know, we started off as a humble little church here in Portland. And, 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 you know, God has been good. And we've expanded. And, you know, we've got uh, some stuff happening in Hayward, but we've got a couple of services now in Warnable, And we've just seen God expanding us. Well, we, we this is called... Increase that God is providing. It's a multiplication. It's just coincidence that your pastor's from Malta, so we can multiply. I thought that was funny. Where's Alex? Oh, he's in kids' church. I need some new jokes. Anyway, well, we've multiplied, right? So we've got lots of things happening. Now, if we have a look at the next slide, just to bring it into context to where we're at as a church, because sometimes we don't see this. This is the recorded attendance of our church. So you see we started off around about here in January 2019, and now in January 23, we're like, you know, I don't know how much more times bigger that is. That's across the, the three services we have. You can see there's a growth that's come about. And it's not about numbers. I get it. We're, we're here. We're, 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 we're trying to be here to glorify God, not to worry about how many people come to church and whatnot. But at the end of the day, we're also here to build the kingdom of God. And we want to see people come to have an experience and a relationship with God so that they don't end up in hell. That's the bottom line. The reality is, you know, when you've got that much growth, you need to increase your capacity in order to cater for that. Otherwise, how are you going to function? A lot of businesses end up growing and growing quickly and they crash because they don't have the infrastructure in place to maintain the business. Does that make sense? So, in order for us to increase our capacity, I'm a big believer. Before I challenge the church to do anything, I always challenge myself. Because that's the main thing, that God's going to speak to me, right? And he's going to want me to grow as an individual. And, and in order for us to increase our capacity, I need to increase my capacity. I need to change the way that I am. I can no longer be thinking like we have, you know, one little church that we can focus on where I know every single person's name, middle name, birth date, address, 
what they like for breakfast, what they have for dinner, how many sugars they have in their coffee and all that stuff. Like, you know, I need to think differently because as the church is growing, I mean, we've got a church service happening in Warrnambool right now. Like, I need to be able to, you know, somehow influence the vision there and what's happening there. So I need to increase my capacity. Does that make sense? And so if we have a look at the, um, the next slide there, you'll see that, like, you know, before Rebecca and I, that was the best I could find for a picture of Rebecca. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, well, I wanted to distinguish between Rebecca and myself, you know. Like, so I know it's kind of a bit sexist, but I gave Rebecca a ponytail, you know. But we were like shepherds in Portland, yeah. But we can no longer just see ourselves as just shepherds of Portland. Now God's increasing, you know, we've got Warnable, we've got the Fijian service, and we've got other churches. Our heart is to see the kingdom of God expand. I want to see more churches growing, especially in regional Victoria, where people say, oh, it's only regional Victoria, churches can't grow in regional Victoria. Well, I don't know. Last I checked the Bible, the Bible says that God brings about an increase, that some plant, some water, and he brings an increase. There was no mention of location. No mention of regional, urban, city, in Malta, Australia. Just go to all the ends of the earth. So why should we be limited? Break off limitations, amen? So the point is, in order for us to be able to manage all these, Rebecca and I need to not so much be shepherds, but be ranchers. In other words, be managing shepherds. Does that make sense? As long as we don't all smell like shepherds, we'll be okay. <laughs> Nothing wrong with smelling shepherds, amen? So the point is that God's been speaking to us. And you know what I love about the fast? It's when, when, you know, Rebecca and I, during the fast, we always pray and say, Lord, speak to me. What is it? Give, give me a word for the year. Speak to me, you know. And I remember halfway through the fast, Rebecca said, oh, did God speak to you? I'm like, yeah, did he speak to you? Yeah, I said, will you tell me what he told you? And I'll tell you what he told me because, you know, I don't want to tell her in case she's going to change her what God spoke to her and didn't line up with me. I'm like, we want to. anyway, so we're sort of having this little banter. And then on the, halfway through the last week, we're like, all right, on the count of three, let's say what God spoke to us. So we both shared what God spoke to us. And do you know what happened? He said the exact same word. It happens almost every year, doesn't it? I can't remember a year we were different. You know, and I guess, you know, <laughs> I was chatting with Wayne. He's like, why are you surprised? Like, God has to speak. I'm like, I know, but it's just exciting, you know. So the point is that, like, you know, God spoke to us. And I want to share that with you because the words that he spoke to us for this year is really simple. It's listen and obey. That's it. You know, I'm a sort of a guy where I love vision. I'm a sort of a guy where I like to see things happen. I'm a sort of a guy where I'm like, you know, I'll be meeting with people, meeting with departments, and like I'm already 10, 20 years ahead. And Rebecca's always like, I think you've got to pull back a bit because, I'm, you know, people have got to join the dots. You know, you can't be living too. I'm a vision kind of a guy. I love vision. And I'm ready to like, all right, let's do it. Let's take on the world. Let's put things in place. Let's reach these people. Let's reach those people. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's multiply. I'm not going to say my Maltese joke again. You know, and, and so, you know, and I felt God say, just listen and obey. You don't have to plan a hundred things. All you need to do is stop and listen and obey. And a funny thing happened. When we were at the Planet Shakers conference, um, I, we, were, we were leaving one of the sessions, and just as I was leaving, Someone caught my eye who was standing near the door there. We're talking like 6,000 people, right? But one particular guy caught my eye. And as I'm walking past, I'm like, oh. And I stopped and I shook his hand. And I'm like, this guy looks familiar. Anyway, he's like, oh, you're Frank. I'm like, yes. And I mentioned his name. Anyway, it turns out I, I, I knew this guy for like 15 years or something, but haven't seen him for about 10 years. Turns out this guy, he's like a major consultant. So this guy used to be a consultant for... Reinhard Bonnke and some of these massive, big, you know, movements that we see happening. So he's quite an amazing guy. He's got lots of strategy, lots of leadership skills, lots of, you know, runs companies in Israel and all over the world. And he happened to be there. And I'm like, oh, dude. And, you know, God's been speaking to me through the conference about, you know, expanding the church and, and how do we manage these things and all that stuff. And, and anyway, and I'm like, 
This must be a God sin. How many times do we walk around things and we see something happen? Well, oh, it must be God, you know, like it fell from heaven. It's God. <laughs> it's always got to be God. That's what we always think. Anyway, and I'm, I'm like, oh, and then brief conversation. I'm like, dude, we need to hook up because oh, I've got some things I want to run by you and want to get your input and all this stuff on, you know, we're expanding, we're growing, how do we go? And he's like, yeah, 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 cool. Anyway, we still had each other's numbers. So he goes, all right, I'll call you. So he rang us and um, uh, I don't know. A week later or so, we're on the phone, we're chatting and we're talking about all this stuff. Anyway, and I'm like, all right, cool, we'll pray and I'll get back to you. And as I'm praying during the fast, I felt God say, why are you like really looking and pressing to try get information from man? Just listen and obey. I've already given you a plan. I've already able to speak to you with what I want to do through you. Why is it that you need to seek counsel from a guy when I'm here for you? Now, I'm not saying that we should never receive counsel from people. I'm not saying that we should never get advice from I mean, the Bible says that multitude of counsel, there is wisdom, right? So there's nothing wrong with bouncing things off people. But it was just in a time when we were fasting and I felt the Lord saying, just stop, just listen. And just obey. And I wonder how many issues we would prevent in our lives if we would just stop, listen, and obey. I wonder how many stressful situations we would not have found ourselves in. I know for me, my life probably would have turned out a lot different. Hopefully I would have still become your pastor. But, you know, I could have saved a lot of heartache and grief and problems and challenges if I would have just stopped and listened and obeyed. That's a word for us today. This is the word for our year, to just listen and obey. If we would just listen to the voice of God and obey what he said to do, life would be so much more easier. I'm not saying life's going to be easy because life is life. But it's certainly easier if you're being led by him and doing what he's asking us to do than if we try to do it our way. Amen? I mean, it's like King Saul. King Saul was chosen by God, chosen by God, a man who stood above the rest. And he was chosen. And he started off serving God and doing things for God until he got a bit cocky. And then he decided to do things his way. He got the Frank Sinatra disease. You know that? I did it my way. Can I join the worship team? You don't call us, we'll call you. I get it. I hear what you're saying. The point is that, like, we can do things our way or we can do things his way. And his way has always got to be the better way. And yeah, I don't, we all know this. I'm sure if I said, who agrees with me, would I put a hand up? We all agree that God's way has got to be better than my way. But here's the problem. How many times do we all just do it his way? Instead, most of us, if I said, let's have a show of hands, who most of the times we do it our way, we'd all put our hands up. You know what I mean? Like, it just, I don't understand why we know the truth, but we don't just apply the truth. Why we try to do it in our own strength. So I want us to have a bit of a look at this. I want us to turn to Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And what we see here is what's known as the Great Commission. Because what I want us to see is how through the pattern of the Bible, there's a vision from God or a word from God or something that God asks you to do. And then there's structure that needs to be put in place, and obedience, and together they work. If we have the structure without the obedience, well, we're not really going to do what he's asked us to do. We're just going to have a good structure. But if we have the obedience and then we don't put the structure in place, well, we're kind of still going to not do it the easy way. Do you know what I mean? And so if we have a look at here, Jesus came and told his disciples, he says, I have given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you can see he's told them to go. Turn to the person next to you and say, go. 
but go after the service. Stick around here. Don't go now. Just stick around. You know, it says go. So Jesus told them to go. And then he says in verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. You see, often we read this great commission where Jesus said, go, make disciples, baptizing them. And we kind of stop there. And we don't read the next line that says, well, teach them to obey all that I've commanded. So God has told them to go. That's the instruction. We've received the vision to these guys, these apostles that were there. He said, go. So they're going to go. Then they had to put a structure in place, did they not? So, you know, they were like, okay, well, we've got to baptise them. We somehow got to baptise so we're going to need water. We're going to need this. We're going to need that. We're going to, you know, spread the good news. We're going to get people saved. We're going to teach them about Jesus, then get them baptised. And then they had to teach them to be obedient. Imagine they didn't obey what Jesus said. We wouldn't have the churches that we have today. We may not have any church if they didn't obey. And so we see that there is a structure and obedience that needed to take place. But wait, there's more. I know I sound like I'm selling steak knives. If we turn to Acts 1 verse 4, so we see here he's given them instructions to go. He's, he's you know, uh, preparing them to build his church. Then after the resurrection, he appears to them, and it says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promise, which you have heard me speak about. Isn't that cool? First he says, go. Now he says, wait. Sometimes we find the Bible a bit confusing because if we don't read it in context and just take one little verse out, we might miss What's being said? The point here is that he's given them an instruction to go, and then he's like, but before you go, wait. There needs to be a structure. You can't just go and just go with the wind and see what happens. You've got to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've got to wait for the gift. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you the tools that you need in order to go. So that you don't just go willy-nilly, but just wait. There's a structure in place. There's a process in place. Go, wait, build by the Holy Spirit, and then go and do what I've asked you to do. So again, we see there is a structure in place, and there is obedience that needed to take place. If they didn't wait, they would have missed, and they would have done things. They probably still would have done okay, but they probably would have lasted a couple of months and then burnt out. You know, because there's only so much you can do in your own strength. And maybe for some of us, we need to stop, listen, and obey rather than try to do things in our own strength because it's exhausting to do things in our own strength. It's exhausting to try and perform, to try and do all. Like, we just have to obey. And if God says, go here, we'll go here. We just obey. It's so good when we listen and we obey. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but we obey. I remember there was one time I was ministering in Melbourne, in the church we were at, and there was a young couple that had been in our church for a couple of months, and I sort of knew them, but not that well. And, and, and there was an altar call, and uh, I felt God say, go and speak to them. And I won't go into the details, but you know, I, I went and sort of said something that I thought was a little bit unusual to say to someone, but that's what God said. So I said, hey, this is what I feel God's saying. Da, da, da. They start crying. They're telling me how they couldn't have a baby and they've been trying for years and years and years and years. They were just about to go on IVF. I said, let's pray. Bang, we prayed. Within a couple of weeks, they got pregnant and had a natural baby. Isn't that awesome? When we obey, God fast-tracks things and does things the easy way. Amen? So we just got to listen and obey Let's keep going. As we keep going through the book of Acts, in chapter 1 still, we get to verse 24. And in verse 24, we says, Then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which one of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. So what had happened, for those of you who may not be familiar with this passage of Scripture, is that um, Judas had basically... Um, you know, he sold Jesus out, you know, uh, and, and then he ended up sort of, uh, yeah, 
let's say, departing from the scene, right? And so he left, and, uh, and, and, and so now they've got 11 disciples. But how many of us know there needs to be structure? They could have went on with 11, but no. They decided to appoint another one so they could, again, have the structure that they needed in order to move forward to execute the vision that God had for them. So they prayed, they sought God, they heard his voice, and they chose out of two men and they appointed one to replace Judas. And so we see once again that we had structure in place with obedience. If we keep turning the book of Acts, we get to Acts chapter 6. By the way, we're going to the book of Revelation, so we might be here for a while. hope you don't mind. Anyone need to be somewhere at lunch? No, just kidding. We'll make this the last one, put you out of your misery. We see in Acts 6 verse 2, it says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So what had happened is now the disciples had gone off and they started doing what God had told them to do and the church started growing and they started like, Lots of people coming in and lots of things happening. And then as they were sort of, you know, going about all this stuff, uh, they found themselves like they were kind of like serving people on tables and all this. And they had a revelation. Hang on a minute. Our church is exploding. We've now got thousands of people coming. You know, we need to dedicate our time into the ministry of the word and appoint other people who could serve on tables. It kind of makes sense. And so this is what happened. They had to restructure so that they could increase their capacity so that they could continually grow the church so they could take the church to further and beyond. And that's what happened. And so they ended up appointing other people and they focused on the things that God had called them to do for that moment, for that season in time. And so again, we see there was structure. And again, we see there was obedience. Again, we see that there was hearing from God and obeying what he's asked them to do. And so it's exciting. This actually is kind of a bit of a, a theme that runs through the whole Bible, that people listen to God, they obey God, and then they execute the plan. They either put a structure in place or do something in order to fulfill what God has called them to do. And so this happens throughout the whole Bible. So we need vision, we need obedience, and we need structure. This is a principle, not just for church. You're like, well, that's great, Frank. That's awesome. I only come here now and then, or I'm visiting on holidays. But this is the same principle that's true for your lives, not just the church. This is the same principle that we need to apply for our families. This is a principle that I need to apply as a father to raise three children and look after a beautiful wife. This is, this is what we need to apply for our families, maybe for your workplace or your career, maybe for a ministry that you're leading. We need to be a people who can, first of all, hear from God, then walk in obedience to what he has for us, and then execute the things that he's asked us to do. So I'm not sure where you're at today. Maybe in the 21 days of seeking God, you know, maybe you kind of focused on praying for the kingdom of God, which is awesome. But maybe you didn't really see God as to what does he want for your family? Or maybe you're still waiting to hear from him. I mean, what is it that you want to see God do in your family this year? We can just chill out and just go with the flow, and just let the wind take us wherever we want to go. Or we could pray, we could seek God, and we could deliberately walk in the purposes of God and take hold of the blessings and the things that he has for us. But what is it that you see? Well, what do you see for your life? What do you see for 2023? Hey, that rhymes. You should write a song. Yo, yo, what do you see for 2023? I want it to be a rapper. But I failed, so I became a pastor. We'll stick to that. Anyway, the point is, like, what is it that you want to see? What's the vision, you know? Like, and, and, and an important question to ask yourself while you're asking these questions of what do I see for myself is what you see, your idea, your vision, or God's vision for your life. Because sometimes we could run off. 
on a vision that we have put in place for me. You know, and it's not really God's vision, but it's kind of like, I want this. And I did it my way. You sure you don't want me on the team, bro? We could use some deep singing voice. Okay, we'll talk later. You know what I'm saying? Like, we can't just do it my way. My way or the highway. We need to do Yahweh, his way. Amen? Like, that's what we need to do. We need to be uh, listening to what he wants because his ways aren't always my ways. I remember maybe, how long we've been married now? 20, 20 years? We, we come up to 20 years. In April, we'll be 20 years marriage. How good is that? Everyone give Rebecca a clap. She put up with me for 20 years. Before, I don't know if we were just married or getting married. I think we were already married. It was in our first year. We, we were married, that's right. And she's like, what's he talking about? You know, when I start sharing these stories, I see Rebecca's toes kind of like <laughs> scrounge up, you know, like she's like, where's he going? It's all right, princess. I've got this. And, and what happened was, um, you know, I remember uh, like God spoke to me about a business idea. At the time, I was a youth pastor of the church. Rebecca was the kids pastor of the church. We spoke a lot on the phone before we were married, and I think you know, being in ministry together kind of brought us even closer, but that's another story. And I remember God spoke to me about this amazing business idea. So we're talking 20 years ago. It was an idea of having a website. Now, you've got to understand in context for those of you that are like less than 20 years old, 20 years ago, internet was kind of a new thing. We still had the dial-up phone. You know, some of us still had the mouse with the cheese running to try to charge up the computer so we could get power through. So, you know, you had to unplug your phone, connect it into the computer. And do, 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 do. Anyone remember those days? And then you finally connect. So you get disconnected, then you got to connect again. And it was very frustrating. You guys don't know what life is like without MBN, mate. You know, but the point is that, you know, we, we, we had to go through all this stuff. So internet was fairly new. And God gave me this amazing business idea about, you know, how people might want to go on holidays and they just don't know where to go. So they'll be like, oh, I want to go somewhere. You know, it was a business where you just go to the website, you can select, you know, like I'll go to, you know, the beach and, you know, this and that. And then you can find out like accommodation. There'll be like hundreds of restaurants and, 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 and accommodation places you can go to and all this stuff. And, you know, you know now today there's quite a lot of these websites about, isn't there? You're all like, yeah, that's no new idea. But let me tell you, 20 years ago, that did not happen. That was a new idea. That was like ahead of the mark. And I believe with all my heart that if I started this, I'd already developed the website and started putting things in place. And I spoke to Rebecca. I'm like, darling, God's spoken to me. We've got this great dream. We're going to be rich. I shared the idea with her. She goes, that's dumb. That's not what God's called. She didn't say the idea was done, but she's like, that's not what God's called you to do. So I'm like, you know what? I was wise enough to know that if God is going to speak to me and it's God, he'll speak to my wife because we're one. And I took that as, thank you, Lord. You saved me a lot of headaches because here's the deal. If I would have taken that business on, I would be rich. Today, I'd be wealthy. I wouldn't be driving around a five, a, a ute with five different colours. Might have seven colours because I'd have extra money to paint. No. <laughs> I'd still have that ute, but maybe a few extra old cars in the garage, you know. But the point is that if I became that rich, wealthy businessman 20 years ago as a young youth pastor, I wouldn't be your pastor today. Because why would I have gone to Indonesia as a mission trip? Why would God left us there five years, spoke to us to come to Portland and then come and run it? Well, I'm busy running a big business, being ahead of the pack. And you weren't, most of you wouldn't even know me today. You'd be like, oh, life could have been a bit better. But no. Just. But the point is that, like, you know, God has a plan. And his way is better than our way. Because you know what? Maybe I don't have millions of dollars. But when I hear about people's lives that are changed, that God used me to speak into someone's life or to pick someone up out of a hole or to help someone's marriage stay together or to minister to someone, mate, 
You could give me a million bucks in exchange, I wouldn't take it. Because changing people's lives is what we're about. Because that's God's vision. That's God's plan. That's what makes a difference. You know, the time will come when I will depart this earth. And I know you'll all be very sad. You're like, oh, Pastor Frank's left us. Don't be sad. I'll be with Jesus. I'll be chilling out. Some gold turntables, you know, spinning out with those angels. I'll be having fun, relaxing. You'll be sad because I'm not here and who else is going to step up to the plate and give jokes as good as I do? But the point is that, like, when I'm gone, the legacy lives on because there'll be a marriage that stayed together because I spoke into their lives. There'll be someone who was probably, you know, uh, in a bad place, but now they're walking with Jesus. There'll be another guy that, you know, I'm thinking of another guy that, you know, was kind of a bit off the beaten track and we pulled him into the youth group around the time that we were married and today he's a, he's a pastor of a church. You know, and, and just all these different guys that we've impacted in people's lives. Why? Because we follow God and we do things his way. We listen and obey and not just do things my way. Amen? So in five minutes, I'm going to give you three hours' worth of vision. It's took a bit longer to... Well, it's, 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 interesting. it's important, isn't it? We all need to listen and obey. It's so powerful. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I've got lots of scriptures I can share about that, but we'll save that for next time. The thing is that we have a mission here as a church. We have a vision. And our vision is... Um, to win the lost and grow the found. It's really that simple. We're here to win the lost and then grow the found. And, and, and the vision is about people. It's not about building stuff. It's about building people. Yeah? And we need to use the church to grow people, not use people to grow the church. It's a very simple thing. But one that if it's not adhered to properly, we're going to find that we're just going to burn people out and build a great church. But we're not building people that are going to outlive the legacy and do what God wants. Because times, times ahead may not be easy. Let me be a little bit more precise. Times ahead are going to be difficult. I just don't know how soon ahead, whether it's tomorrow, next year, next whatever. But times are going to get tough. And we're not going to stand strong unless we have been built into properly so we could have the right structure within our hearts, so we could be strong, so when the wind comes to try and push us left and right, we can stand strong on God's word and not be veered off left or right. Amen? And so that's where that's at. So what it means is what's some of the things that's been spoken to me, because I'll give you the short version now because I ramble on too much. And that is that we need to be deliberate in discipleship. What do I mean by that? Let's have a look at the next slide. We see that our vision is to win the lost and grow the found. We're all on a spiritual journey. That we're called to win people to Jesus, and then we need to grow people, and then we go people. Doesn't make sense. We send people so they can go. <laughs> Does that make sense? So we, 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 we're all on a journey. And we need to be deliberate about this because if we're not deliberate about making disciples, you know what? You can't just expect someone's going to come to church week in, week out for three years and by the end of the three years they're going to know everything about their foundational truth and they know why Jesus died. And, you know, I can't tell you the number of people that I've spoken to that have grown up in church and maybe after, you know, 15, 20 years of being in church, listening to 15 or 20 years' worth of sermons, they still don't have a revelation as to why Jesus died and how he died on a specific day at a specific time in a specific way to bring about salvation. They have no idea how this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that this is infallible, that this is the truth, that this is, the, that this is authentic. They have no idea. And they've grown up in church. I remember having a conversation with someone who grew up in church, a powerful church, a Pentecostal church, and I'm having a conversation with them at the age of, I think they were 25 or something, and telling me that they just, well, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't believe the Bible. 
I don't believe all this stuff. I'm like, but you've been in church all your life. You've heard it all. You've seen moves of the Holy Spirit. You've seen people healed. You've seen people touched by God. And you're telling me you don't even believe if this is real? Why? And as I walked away from that meeting dejected and crushed and thinking, how can this be, God? I felt God speak to me because we're not deliberate about discipleship. We can't just expect things are going to happen. A few farmers in here I can see can grab a seed, chuck it in the ground. You can leave it there and hope for the best. Or you can nurture it and water it and help it grow until it becomes strong enough to survive on its own. We need to be deliberate if we want to see people grow. And so this is where we need to be. And so a couple of things we're going to focus on this year is I actually want to pull back from day-to-day stuff which is what we've sort of been working towards, haven't we? Jason's doing a great job keeping the office afloat. I'm going to take the next three months off to play golf just to see how he goes. It's all part of the plan. Actually, I am on three weeks' holidays, starting from tomorrow. The rest of February I'm off because I'm going to be renovating home, but I'll still be at church, so don't worry. You'll still see me. But, um, but yeah, uh, you know, we're just, you know, it's going to be a great, great, uh, great time of moving forward. And... Um, now that I've said that I've three weeks off, you can all keep me accountable because I know what will happen. Rebecca's already booked us in for a couple of moments. But, <laughs> but you know, but I'm working hard to take this. It's all good. It's just when you love what you do, it's hard to go on holidays, isn't it? Anyway, the point is that we need to take people on a journey and, and I want to focus on, um, you know, discipleship and training. I'm developing a foundational course at the moment, which is I'm just so excited about. I think everybody needs to do it. But at the very least, if you're new to the faith or you've still got questions or you're not sure about stuff or you're seeking, that's got to be for you. You're going to love it, right? It's just going to invigorate your spiritual walk and help you understand, wow, this is so cool. Anyway, it's, it's something that, you know, we're going to be working on. Um, I'm going to be focusing on leadership development because we need more leaders, we need more care groups. I want to see our care groups double by the end of the year. And for that to happen, we're going to need more people who are willing to put their hand up and say, yes, Pastor Frank, look, I'm not perfect. Look, I don't have all the answers. Look, I'm not a theologian, but I love God and I can hear his voice and he'll lead me all the way. I'm like, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? Like we need to be people not perfect because God doesn't call the perfect. He perfects the called. Do you know what I'm saying? So we don't have to wait until we're an angel or that we're the complete reflection of Jesus because I've got news for you all. We've all got a long way to go, your pastor included. But we're pursuing God. And so we want to see that happen. You know, we want to see care groups as a, a fundamental place because you know what? We could build a great church, but if people aren't being cared for, what are we building? A nice-looking building? Well, that ain't really that nice, but we've got plans to make it look nice. But we're here to build people. That's what God is about. He's interested in every single one of us. He loves every one of us. I was sharing with Francine and Rod yesterday about if we had a revelation, a true revelation as to how much God really loved us. I know we all know that God loves us. We all know that, you know, God died for us. We all know all this stuff. But if we had a true revelation to how much God's heart yearns for us and loves us and wants to be with us, 98% of our problems would go. Seriously. I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, all these issues I've got going on in my head because Jesus loves me. This I know. The Bible tells me so. I didn't want to sing it. I thought I'd say it out because I got rejected twice already. Three times is too much for one sermon. So do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we, if we had a revelation of this, and so we, we want to help people grow spiritually and have a deep, intimate relationship with God because that's where it's all at. We're not at church to have a great relationship with Pastor Frank, although I'm happy to be your friends. Anyone wants to take me out for lunch or coffee, I'm open. But what I'm saying is we're here to have a relationship with God. Because if you have an intimate relationship with God and I upset you, you're going to be okay. 
But if you only have a relationship with me and no relationship with God and I upset you, you're destined for trouble. And let's not end up in that place. Amen? So we want to focus on that. Last thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to wrap it up, maybe I'll get the worship team up, is we feel, at least for this immediate season, to change our prayer meetings. We were having prayer on a Friday night, and that was good. But we kind of feel like, let's give God the best part of the day. Why wait till the end of the day? We've worked all day. We're exhausted. Had to put up with my boss. I'm just making this up because, you know, I am the boss here. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You know, and you come exhausted and you, like, you know, had a few arguments during the day. You cut some people off and hopefully you didn't stick your finger up at them, you know, and all that stuff. But you're just sort of having a real bit. And then you come to prayer meeting and you're, all right, we're ready now to worship God. Like, what we want to do is every Tuesday and every Thursday, we're going to have a prayer meeting right here at 8 a.m. I know for some of us, we're working, can't make it. I know for some of us, like Pastor Frank, I don't wake up before 10 o'clock or at least I've had my caffeine fixed, not looking at anyone, so don't yell out. <laughs> you know, but what I'm saying is, you know, like, you know, and I get that, but we just want to try this because we want to put God first. Is that okay? And, and if, you, if you start work at nine and you're able to come and join us, just come here. The door will be open, the, the office door down the bottom here and you can just walk in and we'll just gather here and we'll just worship God Pray, seek his name, seek his face, and put him first. Is that cool? Anyway, we'll start to outwork some of the things because one hour is not enough for me to share what we're going to be doing this year. I'm going to call Rebecca up. Why don't we do communion?